On our last new episode of Av Talk of the Year, Airbus picks up another big order. Qatar sues Airbus over the peeling paint. And John Pitts and Richard Whitwell of EJET return for part two of our conversation about jet fuel as we learn about some of the challenges facing the adoption of sustainable aviation fuel. Hello and welcome to episode 143 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechenik here as always with Jason Rabinowitz on a special Monday afternoon podcast. A Monday afternoon recording because it's our last new episode of the year. It is the the last time I have to talk. No, that's not true. It's not the last time I have to talk to Jason. And it won't be. But and it won't be. But it's our last episode of the year. Next week's episode will be it'll be our yearly clip show, which we hope you enjoy. But for now, we are live. We are in person. We are doing the news that has happened, I guess, in the last couple of days. But thankfully, there's enough to talk about in that person. we can get a, a full we're show out of it. Not, we're not in person unless you're hiding under my desk or something. I'm in the uh, air conditioning unit. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That yeah. explains the rattle I heard. But yeah, <laughs> recording on a Monday, just a disclaimer, we are not legally responsible for any news that happens between now and Friday. So if anything breaks between now and then, you will just have to deal with it. If it's big enough, you'll just have to read the blog. Yep. Yep. Or if it's truly big, there might be a special episode, but that would be very, very unexpected. Yeah, if you are uh, one listener in particular, typically we record on Wednesday and the podcast comes out on Friday. If something happens on a Thursday, don't email us and yell at us that we didn't cover it because D- we D- unfortunately we don't have a crystal ball. No, uh, it, it's back that ordered. would be nice. That it's would be back nice. ordered on Amazon like most other things right now. Yeah, to that person's credit, it happened while we were recording. And slightly after we recorded. So we'll talk about it this week, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We will get to it. In this week's show, we do have part two of our conversation with John Pitts and Richard Whitwell from EJET International. They joined us last week in part one. If you haven't listened to that already, it's a good place to start as far as our conversation goes. We talk about everything you need to know about jet fuel. And in this week's episode, we talk about everything that you're going to need to know about sustainable aviation fuel and what are the challenges, what are some of the benefits, and how long is the road ahead in order to get from what we're doing now to a full-on use of sustainable aviation fuel. And not to really spoil anything, because we've talked about this in the past, it's a very long road ahead, but we'll get there. So before we do that, we had had a note in last week's program, in our show notes, in in Jason, the rundown that Jason and I prepare before we do each show. Yes, we do actually prepare for this show. We're going to talk about KLM's possible order for Airbus narrowbody aircraft. KLM is looking to renew its short haul fleet or I guess medium short-ish, more than intra-European fleet, as well as the Transavia fleet. And we scratched that because last week's show was so long. But of course, as soon as we hit the save button on our recordings, they in fact placed their order. So yes, it happened. We can take responsibility for KLM ordering over 100 Airbus aircraft, right? Yes, we can. We can't be held responsible for any news that breaks, but we can take, I guess, responsibility for the order. I don't know where- I don't know. But this order had long been rumored six months ahead of time. Actually, they even got the exact number of aircraft right. I don't remember where I read that. Maybe it was Reuters, but uh, they got it exactly right that Air France KLM was ordering, firmly ordering 100 Airbus A320neo family aircraft with purchase rights for 60 additional aircraft to renew the fleets of, although this order was placed by the Air France KLM group, the aircraft are actually going to KLM and Transavia, the Netherlands. The order is for both the A320neo and A321neo aircraft with the first delivery starting second half of 2023. So we have a little while before those orders start to come through. Yeah. And that will kind of put another feather in Airbus's cap as far as narrow body orders go, having just taken a a huge order. Well, I mean, in we're saying last week because we're recording this week, but it was really, I think within, was it two days, two or three days 
of the previous large order. So, I mean, there are a lot going the way of Airbus as far as orders and things like that go right now. They also picked up, it was four plus four in the A350 freighter from KLM Air France. But this is interesting. They have conversion rights. They have conversion rights to people instead of boxes. Yeah, usually it's the other way around, I feel like. You don't often see this contingency that uh, I guess if cargo demand dries up, they'll just convert these to regular old A350s, which I guess would probably end up with Air France rather than KLM. Yeah. Yeah, I I think so. But I mean, that's interesting to see how that works out. But I believe that that is the plan. Yeah, it's a big, big, big loss for Boeing as KLM is a huge Boeing purchaser of aircraft. They really have been a mostly Boeing aircraft in recent history. I guess they have had the A330s in their fleet for a while, but those are due to be retired towards the middle of the decade. I think the only other Airbus aircraft they ever had in the fleet was the A310 for a stint in the 80s and 90s. So for Boeing to lose out a customer like KLM, something really must have gone wrong in the negotiation process. Yeah, I mean, not a great showing for Boeing as far as picking up orders, especially as the year comes to a close. But uh, yeah, I I would be very interested to see a a well-reported story on the interior negotiations that are taking place that sees Boeing out on the losing end over these past couple, you know, huge orders that they had good contention for, including the Qantas order and the KLM order. Let's stick with the A350. As things continue to ramp up between Qatar Airways and Airbus. So last episode, we talked about Airbus issuing a public statement saying, we are exploring our legal options. Today, Qatar Airways did one better. And I guess- went with a legal option. They pushed they, the button. They they pushed the button. So an interesting way of phrasing this, but I'll read the headline from Qatar's press release. Qatar Airways issues legal proceedings against Airbus in the Technology and Construction Division of the High Court in London, which is a fun way of saying we've sued Airbus because we can't reach an agreement on how to fix the issue that is affecting 21 of the Qatar Airways A350s. What's really interesting to me is that all along Qatar has said Qatar Airways has said it's the Qatari civil aviation regulators that are grounding the aircraft. It's not the airline. But the airline is the one that is suing Airbus saying that they haven't been able to reach accommodation on this. So I'm a little confused as to what this means as far as I guess, where things come down on who's responsible for keeping these aircraft grounded. Is Qatar Airways not satisfied with what Airbus has proposed? Because Airbus has said, we've told them a bunch of different things that we can do. They just won't listen to us. Qatar Airways has said, we don't think it's the root cause, so we're not going to do that because you can't promise us it won't happen again. And meanwhile, the Qatari regulator is silent, but they've grounded the aircraft. Yeah, it's really weird that all of the communication about this grounding by the Qatari regulators has come through Qatar Airways rather than the regulator itself. It seems kind of backwards, but I guess we will stay tuned and see what happens. At this point, I am just excited that it is going to some sort of legal proceedings and that we will most certainly get much more visibility into what's actually happening here since everything up until now has been behind closed doors or behind a a private Airbus forum that we haven't really been able to see. But now we should be actually able to get some insight into what's happening. Yeah, that'll be an interesting one to see what exactly Qatar thinks is the problem. Because Airbus has basically said it's a paint issue. It's a surface issue. It's something that we can easily fix, or if not easily fix, then resolve. And Qatar always seems to be saying, no, we think it goes a lot deeper than that. And here's what. So I'm very interested to see exactly what Qatar Airways thinks the problem is and, and why they, they haven't been able to agree on, on a fix. So that, I guess, we have to follow high court in London proceedings now. Yeah, this would get really exciting if we see another airline jump into Qatar's lawsuit with them. 
I could see that something like that actually happening, but no other airline has actually expressed the level of concern that Qatar has. So maybe that's not likely, but it is a possibility. Yeah. I, I mean, who knows? I do not. Again, our crystal ball is, is backwards. Yeah, everything's backwards. Supply chain. We talked about this briefly last episode, but I, I just sticking kind of with the Airbus theme as the beginning of the show rolls through. The final A380 has officially been delivered. A6 Aww. EVS serial number 272 went home with Emirates late last week. It is done. It is delivered. It is in Dubai. There is no more. It did do a cool low pass, though. I will say that. Yeah, and about as low as they can get without doing an actual touch and go, I believe. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, looking at both the ADSB data and the video that someone shot, yeah, it, it got down there. They almost said hello again before saying goodbye. Yeah, they just wanted to get one more pass in Dubai before they headed over to uh, UK airspace before finally heading over to Dubai. Yeah, yeah, they uh, depart Hamburg do a low pass, head over to touch UK airspace to do the whole financial arrangement finalization, and then off to Dubai, which we've talked about this before, about how it's necessary to be in the airspace of the financing, things like that. But they, I swear at the beginning of the pandemic, we talked about them doing away with this because it's both stupid and wasteful. But I guess that hasn't happened yet. Yes. I guess like many other uh, COVID protocols, maybe it is no longer a thing or never actually became a thing. No. In any case, we also have the final A320 family CEO has been delivered. So on the same day, no less. Yeah, on the same day. Yeah, on the same day. Uh, roughly the same time. Delta A321 registered November 129, Delta November. That went home from the Airbus facility in Mobile. So my big question to you, Jason, mm -hmm. does the NEO now become the CEO? Does the NEO now become the CEO, the classic yeah. engine option? What would you call it? Because it's the new engine option is just the engine option now. I guess until all currently operating and airworthy A320 CO Ooh. family aircraft are grounded and ripped apart in a desert somewhere, the 320 Neo will still be the 320 Neo. Okay. I'll allow that. That was a very detailed and I don't want to call it reasonable, but reasoned answer. So hey, I'll you, take you it. You asked on the spot, so I came up I'll with take it. I'll take it. Yeah, that was impressive. That was some mighty fine loitering. Yeah, it was just odd that on the same day that the A380 got so much love, the 320CO was had its final delivery. Not a peep from anyone. I don't think I Airbus peeped. said anything. You peeped. Uh, no, I peeped, I but I don't think Airbus said anything. I don't think Delta said anything. Nobody really acknowledged to my knowledge that this happened. Well, I don't think anyone wanted to acknowledge that they're still taking delivery of older engine variants. I think that does not fit well with the current marketing push for a more green and environmentally friendly airline. I mean, unless you frame it and say, hey, all of our future aircraft deliveries are a NEO or some other equivalent. Sure. But you still but it have happened. to point out that it's it done. happened. Yeah, it's it's done. So there's our top of the hour Airbus update. What do you say we take a quick break? And when we come back, we'll enjoy the second part of our chat with John Pitts and Richard Whitwell from EJET and learn all that we can about the long and really uphill climb that we have to get to sustainable aviation fuel dominance. So stick around with us. We'll be right back. So I want to shift a little bit about how you expect the delivery of, of SAFs in the future, or how does it work today? And how is the industry going to adapt to make it widely available in the near future? The industry is in a very nascent stage with SAF to start off with. The quantities of SAF that have been used for flight so far 
whilst there are many flights that have taken place, some on a commercial basis, the amounts of SAF compared to conventional jet fuel are very small indeed. So as SAF grows in volume terms, it's going to become certainly more mainstream. John, can I interrupt you for just yeah. a second and ask, you said it's a very small proportion, but this, and Richard, you mentioned this number the other day and I almost fell out of my chair. How much jet fuel is used around the world every year or, or even in a day or, or just a figure to kind of give this scale that we're talking about here? Yeah, there's not an exact figure on it, but it's somewhere in the region of 300 to 350 billion liters a year. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. When you consider that the aviation industry is pegged with creating something like two to three percent of the greenhouse gases, just two to three percent of the greenhouse gases that are produced across the whole globe, when you think that 300 to 350 billion liters of burnt fuel only causes that, you, you realize what you're up against, really. Right, right. And that's the other thing. I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, for all. Obviously, we're aviation focused and we think aviation is the center of the universe, but it's not. And I think that was one of the recognitions that we can chat about this in a moment about how, you know, the, some of the challenges of, of getting, you know, SAF done is, is outside of aviation. But I just wanted to kind of jump in there and give a bit of a context of, you know, we've got this much SAF, we use this much fuel in a year. So anyway, the challenges of kind of getting SAF into the pipeline system. Mm, there are a few SAF projects underway at the moment and a couple of them are going to be coming online commercially very soon and they're sized typically in the 50 to 100,000 tons per year bracket which is laudable because there's some fairly sophisticated technology being employed there but to put that into some sort of context a major airport like London Heathrow, Singapore Changi, Hong Kong will be delivering that sort of tonnage of jet fuel in less than a week. So one of those SAF plants would only keep a major airport, like I've mentioned, supplied for about a week. So it's going to take many SAF plants around the world, and they are going to be distributed because their raw materials are of a local nature if it's for example municipal solid waste or algae or biomass from the land a number of distributed SAF plants are going to be needed to support each airport let alone each country so it's a different scale your refineries work in millions of tons SAF plants work in at the current scale working hundreds of thousands of tons Per annum. I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, if you're looking at 100,000 tonnes of SAF being produced, that's roughly 120 million litres hmm. of jet fuel. That's what yes. you do. The density of jet fuel is about 0 0.8 kilograms per litre. So it's slightly lighter than water and such. So, I mean, one of the things that seems to be extremely challenging here is the scale up because you can, I mean, I guess for lack of a better term, you can suck up as much petroleum you know, from the ground as possible. I mean, it, you know, based on that, and and we've already you know scaled that up. But a hundred thousand tons versus millions of tons, you know, that seems like a well. You have to think about it as well that that, that industry has been going for you know over a century. Right, well. right. You know, the infrastructure is there. That the current fossil fuel infrastructure is there. It's been going for decade after decade after decade. So you've got all that basis of knowledge and. And this ready flow just coming straight out of the ground once they find another another well to use. And you've got to translate that into a SAF supply chain in, well, but people have been trying to do it for the last few years now, at least 10 years. And, you know, it hits the buffer of commercial viability really all the time. But to scale it up to sort of the fossil level is significant undertaking. On a country basis, I would say. This is something we've talked about, you know, in previous episodes, and especially the one after the Airbus summit, where Airbus CEO Gyeong Furry was basically like, Yeah, we want to do this, but it's gonna take a lot of government money. Yeah. That's absolutely right. The I think it's fair to say that airlines would 
buy and use as much SAF as they possibly could because of its green credentials, because of marketing capital that they can make. They'd use as much SAF as they possibly could, provided that the price was right and there was adequate supply. And those are the two things that are not there yet. The price of SAF is arguably somewhere between four and seven times what it is for jet fuel. And the supply, uh, as we've mentioned, is very small compared with overall demand around the world for jet fuel. And the supply chains for conventional existing fuels are well established, as Richard said. So it means that these distributed delocalized SAF plants will have to feed into, at some point, existing supply chains to get fuel to airports and to airline customers. And there's another issue as well, and that is that aircraft airframes have very long development times and operating lifetimes. So I would say that it's pretty well impossible, unreasonable to change an aircraft to use a new type of fuel. And therefore, the new type of fuel will have to be compatible with aircraft that are currently in operation and are also on the drawing board at the moment. And that's all the talk we've heard about drop-in SAF. Mm. But that's kind of, I mean, Richard, we talked about this beforehand, and this was another thing I wanted to make sure we covered on the podcast while we were recording, because I was like, oh, we should have recorded this. Drop-in isn't, it takes, I was surprised by how much effort it takes to get SAF to be drop-in. So could you explain kind of, and Scott Kirby mentioned this briefly about the additives, and this is something that I just found absolutely fascinating. You know, it's, I mean, the chemistry is well beyond my ability, but it's just, you know, so fascinating to find out how much work it takes to get the fuel to match up. Yeah, I think what we're referring to there is the fact that it has to be mechanically blended because it is a slightly different chemical makeup now i'm no chemist either here in so you know before <laughs> before i start we don't we but, don't need to get into the chemistry but yeah, yeah that, that's what i was referring to is kind of the physical work that it takes to make drop in saf and, and for the folks at home I'm using air quotes here drop in saf be drop in yeah there's some very complicated chemistry required in any of the approved pathways by which some group of molecules now known as SAF, are certified to be aviation compliant. There are, I think, seven different, I think it's six, sorry, six. Yeah, it depends on what, what you count really there, isn't it, John? Some yeah. subsets in yeah. them of materials known as sustainable aviation fuel produced by different methods, which can be used in conjunction with conventional jet fuel because we've already seen the volumes of SAF are very low at the moment and to satisfy the market it means SAF has to be blended into a pool of conventional jet fuel at some point in the supply chain and therefore it has to perform when mixed with conventional jet fuel just as conventional jet fuel does because that's what the aircraft requires. So it has to perform, it has to look like, it has to smell pretty much like conventional jet fuel. So to get something that's been made from municipal solid waste or from waste vegetable oil, animal fats, algae, something like that, to make that into a translucent, non-volatile, material that is of similar density to existing jet fuel has and does require a lot of chemistry, a lot of technology. And that's very exciting because a lot of different possible pathways have emerged. 
And unlike conventional jet fuel, which all comes from some form of crude oil, within reason, SAF could come from a variety of different sources around the world. So before we wrap up our conversation, I want to ask one, I guess, pointed question of you to give us a prediction. Is the industry goal of, you know, 10% SAF by the end of the decade, is that a reasonable one that the industry can meet or is this just marketing? Uh, so well, kind of it's, like it's an aspiration, isn't it? You know, it's an aspiration that someone in the, I suppose, in the political forum has to put in play, you know, to try and actually gets things moving whether it's actually achievable or not i mean if you're talking you know 10 percent of 300 billion liters then you know only time will tell there's a lot of plans on the drawing board at the moment if they all come off then you know we'll be heading on the way but it's still quite a it's a steep slope yeah i think some airlines may be able to claim that I'm doubtful that all airlines will be able to claim that by the end of this decade. I mean, the uh, thing is, is in governmental terms, and this is discussed at some length at the recent IATA Fuel Forum, what is going to make it happen? You know, that there are a number of governmental obligations that are looking to be in place across Europe, across the UK, there is the world as well, you know, that will oblige the airlines to take on an amount of SAF. Now, that's great and you know as we've said before the airlines will be more than happy to oblige to be honest because they don't want to be the, the you know the dirty guys in the room sort of you know insisting on not being green that they, they absolutely don't they want to be as green as they can be but the key thing is is they can't buy it they can't meet the obligation so there's a very much a, a bit of a quandary going on at the moment about who will okay great government thank you very much you put this obligation in now what we're going to do to actually get it produced? Are you going to help us, or are you going to help the industry, the, the producing industry, to actually get off the ground a bit quicker, making, giving them some tax breaks or give them some other bonuses some way or other to make it easier for these SAF plants to be created? You know, are you going to waive planning laws through or something? Like, you know, any number of right, incentives right. That, that will allow it to happen, and that's the sort of discussion that is going on at the moment with the people like IATA and other such industry bodies that are looking to progress this and get it moving to where it needs to be. John Pitts is Managing Director, Richard Whitwell, Business Analyst at EJET, Fuel Consultant Extraordinaire. Thank you, gentlemen, so very much for joining us. This has been an enlightening and surprisingly hopeful conversation, I think, to end about where the industry is heading. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. It's now time to discuss the thing that hadn't happened yet when we got yelled at for not discussing the thing that hadn't happened yet. But now that it's happened, we're going to discuss it. Got it, Jason? Uh, yep. Excellent. So while we were recording and continuing after we recorded last week, the Aviation Subcommittee met in the halls of the US Congress and hauled in airline CEOs and union leaders to discuss pandemic era flying and all that good fun stuff. And the comments were mostly along the lines of all of the comments that had previously been made by airline CEOs and union leaders about flying during the pandemic. But one of the things that kind of generated the most news was the fact that Gary Kelly, the outgoing CEO of Southwest Airlines, had this to say. Yeah, I think the case is very strong that masks don't add much, if anything, in the air cabin environment. It's very safe and very high quality compared to uh, any other indoor setting. So Gary got a wide variety of condemnations all around, and people took issue with what he had to say. And that was kind of before I had listened to it. And then when I went back and listened to what he actually had to say, I was like, oh, okay, I see what he's getting at. Yeah, I understand what he said, but he said it in a less than elegant way. Right. So a lot of people took what he had to say as masks are useless, which 
They're not. His argument was that the masks themselves are superfluous and they don't add much more than you know the high quality cabin filtration systems and things like that, which I take issue with separately because if you're flying on certain aircraft, especially domestically in the US, you're not necessarily going to have all of those high quality cabin filtration systems. But That's true, even on some of United's own aircraft. I think the E-145s, I think, may or may not have HEPA filters. They did not at first, but I think they I think they added them, but neither here nor there, because basically the issue as far as the masks are concerned and and the study that he was basing that information on, and and Sarah Nelson kind of picked this up right after Kelly spoke, was basically those – studies that he's quoting actually said that you know the masks were helpful and they didn't really replicate real world conditions because we were using mannequins and, and things like that and kind of setting all that aside because he wasn't saying that masks aren't a good idea he's just saying that they they're not adding you know much in the way of the cabin air filtration system things like that which is odd to me and the point i wanted to get is saying that is odd to me because in aviation safety, we're constantly talking about a Swiss cheese model. We're constantly talking about how it's never just one thing that leads to an aviation incident or an accident or a crash. So I guess the question becomes is why wouldn't you want to have as many slices of Swiss cheese as you could possibly get? Is he saying that people don't want to book a flight because they have to wear a mask? Because if that's true, the demand, you know, has really come back. And that's setting aside anything about the wisdom of the demand coming back at this particular point in time. Yeah. I mean, look, he took the party line one step too far and read too much into their own rhetoric. It is worth pointing out that these studies that were jointly done between United and the DOD way back in 2020 – Those were conducted using data from the OG coronavirus, basically, before any variant, before the Delta variant doubled down on contagious spread, and before the Omicron variant seemingly quadrupled down on Delta. So whatever the study was back from early 2020 is now completely useless, null, and void at this point. We've learned so much more about this virus than we knew in early to mid-2020 that that study should be barred from being referenced in any materials at this point, especially at the CEO level, because it's just nonsense. But it's you still need to wear a mask. It doesn't matter what an airline CEO says. It doesn't matter what they believe. It is federal guideline, federal law at this point, pretty much universally around the world, even in the Nordics, they reinstituted mask requirement where they very, very briefly lifted it. But I'm still going to anyway, because if someone sneezes sitting next to me, it doesn't matter how much air filtration and HEPA filters and disinfection of the aircraft goes on because that person sneezed right next to me. So if the air is exchanged in the aircraft every four minutes, that's a long four minutes where that person who sneezed next to me is still right next to me. So I'm going to keep wearing my mask. I recommend everyone else does. And it doesn't matter what I recommend because that's the rule and deal with it. I'm going to start an airline that flies only DC-3s and we'll just keep the windows open. That's great. We know you can open it on the A350 in the flight deck at altitude very briefly. (laughs) The the A400. A400. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that works. I mean, everything flies at 9,999 feet. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about... Cebu Pacific's first A330 NEO that had 2,475,000 seats. That sounds right. This week, French B took delivery of its first A350-1000 that has, I think, 4 trillion more seats than even that aircraft. It has 480 seats, 440 economy class seats, and 40 business class seats. That's a lot of seats. That is a lot of seats. And to clarify, it's not technically business class, it's premium economy. And a part of the way they actually got to this level is uh, on the A350-900 they have in their fleet, the configuration is in every row, there's two, three, two seats. And on the A350-1000, they added an extra seat in every row. So they got a couple extra in that way. So instead of two, three, two, it's two, four, two. And that is a lot of seats. It's clearly by far the most seats on an A350 to date by 
quite a little margin. But we discussed before we started recording, it is not yeah. even close to the most number of seats on any twin engine aircraft. Good luck to whoever wants to set that record. Yeah, this one Please is going to stand. This record for the 350 is going to stand for maybe all time, unless someone goes full economy, nose to tail, which, uh, you know, it, it will happen at some point. It will be eclipsed and somebody probably will get to 500. But at this point right now, the next densest A350 is a 900 from World to Fly and Iberio Jet. Both of them have 432 seats on board. That's a lot of seats. No, thank you. Nope. But hey, if that's what helps people get where they're going, then yep. good luck. Yeah, if that's how you get $139 fares from Newark to uh, Paris, so be it. So let's stay in Spain for a second and talk about the collapse of the IAG Air Europa merger. And I think that's all we really need to say about it. Yeah, I forget exactly when this was announced. I think it was, was it early 2020? Yeah, it was at some point. Yeah. It was at some point poorly timed (laughs) immediately before the world ended. Yeah, it was just not a good idea then and has since stayed not a good idea. No, immediate buyer's remorse. At some point, I think that the deal was, the value was halved. And at this point, IAG, who's the parent company of British Airways and Iberia, kind of said, uh, you know what? We don't really want this anymore. Yeah, and there were competition issues as well as far as approving, you know, what the deal structure would look like. And then they said, oh, we'll redo the deal structure. And then they said, no, forget it. But if we come back in the new year, maybe we'll figure something out. So this all seems very like a a long and winding road to say this was a bad idea and we don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. I am personally happy that this did not go through because Europe does not need any more airline consolidation. So- I just hope Air Europa or the parent company, who is a Globus, has enough money to keep operating the airline. That one, I can't help you with. I don't know about that one. I don't, yeah, we'll see. We have some eVTOL, well, actually just E news. We'll start with the eVTOL, though. Archer celebrated its first flight. The Archer Maker, which is their two seat prototype, flew for the first time on December 16th kind of right around the the date of the first powered flight by the Wright brothers. I think that's what they were going for. But that is an eVTOL that will have, what are the specs? It will say 150 miles an hour and 60 mile limit. Uh, So almost 100 kilometers they'll be able to go. And so that hovered for the first time and it will continue to work. And then they're trying to go into service in 2024. Then Hart Aerospace, which is working on a 19-seat electric aircraft, flew a one-fifth size scale model of their ES-19 this week as well. So electric aviation in progress. Some interesting stuff happening, but of course, very early days. Very, very early days. Yes. It's uh, funny that these things take off as like basically little model versions of themselves, like a one-fifth scale model of the heart uh, aircraft is just it's funny because it's i guess it's it is something you kind of see in commercial aviation but yeah with, with trainers and, and little models but nothing we've really i guess seen airbus or boeing do in, in how long like everything's computer modeled and they just build the plane and fly it yeah i mean on, it's on the like other they made hand. a one fit size a350 or 787 and you don't know that I don't know. Well, the first 787 was made of wood, so technically it was a model, right? Yeah. I mean, I know what you're saying. The interesting thing there is, I don't know. I mean, there might be a one-fifth size A350 model sitting around in someone's office somewhere. Uh, And if there is, please email us at podcast.fr24.com and let us know how we can come and collect it from you. But... Yeah, I don't know other than that. I will say it is exciting to actually see some of these things flying, even if they are just scale models. Yeah, the video I think of the Archer I watched, it took off, it did a little stutter step, and then it landed. So it is progress. It went in the air. It went in the air. Speaking of things in the air, we close the show with a reminder that you can track Santa 
on Flight Radar 24. This year, as always, search for Santa or Ho Ho Ho, or if you're feeling super nerdy, you can search R3 DN053. I'll let you all write that out and see what it looks like. Enjoy. Uh, that is it for the year. We are off to other pursuits for a little while, and we'll be back in the new year with new shows. Some very exciting stuff, I hope, coming up. We're, like everyone else, kind of uh, at the whim of health and safety, but we're going to try and stay healthy and safe, and we hope that you all do the same. Thank you so much for listening this year. Again, next week we'll have a recap of some of our favorite interviews over the past year. And then uh, in the new year, we'll have new shows. So this has been episode 143 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with Jason Rabinowitz. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 